So let's go ahead and get started, you guys. And uh, so we appreciate you guys coming out tonight. I know it's really snowing hard out there. So you know, if everybody else is in the store and getting their toilet paper and milk and all that stuff. So we just have to so much. But we really appreciate you guys coming. And we're going to talk tonight uh, for our parents' lecture. And he's trying to answer the question of what can I do as a parent to minimize my gymnast risk of injury and also enhance her performance. And so we hope to answer that question for you guys tonight. And so there's, uh, we're going to give you some tips and some ways to, to do exactly that and things that you can implement right away. So, and we're going to kind of, uh, you know, when you think about a, a teenage athlete, uh, they don't necessarily, they aren't necessarily all that interested in what they can do to, to avoid an injury, right? But when you tell them that if you do that, it will also help you be a better gymnast and, and do your sport better. Then that gets their attention. So, and so that's what we're going to try to do to talk through some of those things. And we're going to take kind of a tag team approach. So I'm going to start off initially, and I'll talk about some just miscellaneous things that uh, that might be helpful for you guys. And so, for you guys that don't know me, I'm Phil Raleigh, and I've been working with gymnasts for uh, over 30 years now. So a good long time. And working with Hills for about 18 years, uh, probably a little bit more than that. And I'm also a father of two daughters, and so I feel your pain. So I know what it's like, and sometimes that's a challenge, and trying to keep motivated and moving and getting into the, the, you know, the practice and all that. So I know what that's like. So, uh, and then Casey over here is also going to be talking, and she is uh, she's also a PT. She's been working with Hills for at least two or three years now, and uh, she's also a registered dietitian. So she's going to talk about nutrition and hydration and some of those types of things. She's also a certified strength and conditioning coach, and she was a college soccer player and also a college coach. So she knows high-level athletes, and especially women. She's worked with a lot of them, so she has a good sense of, of what, that, what that entails. And then Zach is also here with us. He's a former 10, uh, 11, 10 club gymnast. I know. Where's my picture? So he was a collegiate gymnast at Temple, and he's also a competitive coach at Hills. Uh, he coaches level six and seven. So he's also a crazy nut doing a handstand at the Grand Canyon. So unfortunately he held his handstand long enough not to go over the edge. So whatever risk for injury, I think his parents talked to him about, he didn't listen to that. So, okay, so why why are we even having this talk? Uh, and uh, primarily because gymnastics has one of the highest injury rates really of any sport. And that's I think you guys know that if you have gymnasts that are at the higher levels, you know. It's just the way it is. So, and compared to 20 years ago, obviously these guys are starting at earlier ages. Uh, their practices are a lot longer, and the time they spend practicing is longer. And the skills are just have gotten much, much more difficult. And so every four years, the, the, the difficulty level of the skills goes up after they open. So, uh, so that's that's one of the reasons uh, why the, uh, the injury rate is so high. So this this is the first page of one of your packets there. And there's five steps to keeping your, your athlete uh, safe and injury free. And so this is from a guy named Joss Eldridge, who's up in Massachusetts. He's a, he's a chiropractor. He's got a lot of really good ideas and some of the things that we have that I have in my portion of the talk uh, come from him. So this pyramid basically is, shows that if you look at the bottom part of the pyramid, the nutrition and the hydration, those two sides, those are vital bases for keeping your, your gymnast healthy and injury-free. And so Casey's going to focus on that, those two components. And so she'll be talking about that. Uh, so and then the, the proper movement, the third part there, uh, that's also a key piece because you can have to be eating great, be well hydrated, but if your body's not doing what it needs to do, then you're to, it's a higher chance of getting hurt. And also it can affect your performance. So those three areas right there are three areas that you guys as parents have an impact on. The top two, strength and skills, that's really, really where the coaching comes in. And so practice, that's, you know, that, that's where most of those things are going to happen. But if you don't have the base, it makes it a lot harder to have these two things working as well. So as parents, uh, you want to, you, know, you, you guys are with the, the, the athlete most of the week. You, know, you probably think they're always in practice and it's 35 hours or, or whatever it is, 30 hours a week. You, know, you think they're always in practice, but and they are there a lot, but there's a lot of time that you guys have, really have control over. 
And so what, what you guys do outside of practice makes a big difference. So that's what we're going to talk about. So, okay, so teamwork makes the dream work. You know, everybody's heard that, that uh, kind of metal that is. And uh, so in order to, for your gymnast to progress and get to a point where she's able to really compete at a higher level, you guys that have done that, you know that it takes a team of people. You know, it's not just you guys, it's not just the coaches, although obviously they're the two most important pieces, but you have to have good physicians that you trust. And you need good the physical therapists that you trust, the good gymnastics and that can take her, you know, can uh, understand the stresses of the sport and understand the, the need to get back quickly and, you know, that type of thing. So, uh, you definitely that and other healthcare practitioners, acupuncturists, massage therapists, you know, there's always those, that group of people also that can really help help your gymnast stay out of the, the, the uh, out of the, the, the physician's office and, and physical therapist's office. So, uh, so when we're all a team, our, gym, our gymnasts get better and become better gymnasts. So all of us, all of those providers have to work together to uh, to uh, help our, those those athletes get better and help keep them out there on the out there to the practice. So this guy, uh, Josh Elders, that I mentioned, he, he runs a website called Gym, Gymnast Care, and he came up with this idea of a provider's visit form. And I think, I think it's a really good idea, uh, because basically it helps facilitate that communication between you guys, the athlete, your coaches, and then also whatever provider you happen to be seeing. So uh, basically that's in your packet, so that's one of the pages in your packet, so you'll have a, you, you can make some copies of that if you guys want to use them. But you see the top part, it kind of talks about whatever the main complaint is that the, the athlete's dealing with. And then here, that's the uh, parent's observation. It's one of the things that I find is, you know, you guys as parents, you tell I learn a lot from you guys in terms of what's going on. Because if I just talk to the athlete and go out to the, you know, you guys see little subtle things that happen, and that makes a huge difference. It really helps a lot. So whatever observations you guys might be seeing, because, you know, they, she might be, bounding up and down the stairs, uh, and looking great, and then one day suddenly she's kind of walking up the stairs, and you say, what, are you hurting? Oh, no, no, I'm not hurting at all. I feel great. But they're, but they're really, you're seeing changes in what she's doing in behavior that she doesn't really recognize, and so you guys as parents have to play a big role. So that's important for the doctor to know, it's important for me as a physical therapist to know. So, and then also the coaches, uh, contribution it helps a lot too because they're seeing things on the floor that you guys don't know as parents. We can't see as healthcare providers, but uh, the coaches see some subtle changes going on. So if you get all three of those and bring that into your provider's office, it's a huge help. So it really helps uh, get us get a much broader picture of what's going on. Uh, and then taking notes. I think it's always a great idea when the parents are there taking notes on their phones or uh, because it just, uh, you, uh, that information then can get to the coach in an accurate way. Because uh, if you have like a 14-year-old athlete hearing what the doctor's telling them or what the physical therapist is telling them, and then they go back to the coach, and so it's kind of their perspective on what the, what the, what the, uh, the, the provider told them, that's not always very accurate. Because their 14-year-old focus is not always right where it needs to be. They're thinking about how their hair looks or their, you know, their, uh, the, the cute guy that sat next to them the other day, you know, that type of thing. So we're not always focused where it should be. So that makes a big difference. And then any at-home exercise, and we, all, we typically give you guys uh, exercise sheets. But sometimes that works. Sometimes it's better to videotape the exercises. Sometimes it's better to just take pictures. So there's lots of different ways to do that. But this form, I think, can really help facilitate that communication between all the providers. So I think that's a really good thing. OK. So let's move on to the next sheet that's also in your student's in your, uh, pack. I think it might be this, 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 this the sheet right before that, but that's in there. Um, we also talked about daily monitoring sheets, where you can monitor the, the five different parameters that really help us in terms of recognizing what's going on with an athlete. And so, um, that's just a good example of that. But there's a number of different things. One of the, 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 one of the things to look at is soreness level. And soreness level, uh, zero to 10, athletes are not sore at all. They have no levels of discomfort. Uh, 10 out of 10, they're incredibly sore. And they're really feeling, uh, from the training that they're doing, they're really feeling a lot of uh, 
challenges with that. For, for us to know those kinds of things and for you guys to be able to monitor that on a regular basis makes a big difference as far as being able to figure out, well, why are these injuries happening when they are? And why, are the, why is their back suddenly hurting uh, more than it normally does? And because it could be that they're, they're pushing a little too hard in practice and that soreness level is staying really high for an extended period of time. It could also be that their fatigue level is very, very high. You know, maybe they're stressed about something, or uh, they're just they're um, you know, they're just absolutely exhausted, and so they're they're not going to be able to protect themselves as well because they're really exhausted. There. And so, uh, so it, it, there's kind of a uh, rating scale there with that. But then, if you look at the number of hours slept, I think that's a major factor. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But you know, getting enough hours of high quality sleep is a big challenge for gymnasts because especially if you guys are doing if they're doing 30 35 hours a week and then homework and then class you know, it's just very difficult to get the, get the quality of sleep that they need but that's a really important piece for recovery so and then basically this monitoring sheet will help you monitor well how many sleep how many hours of sleep did you get at the beginning of the week and then your back started to hurt or you, you know you're landing short more often you know those kinds of things so that's the, so that sheet's in there as well, and it's a good idea to treat those too. So, yeah. uh, just real quick, how much sleep does my daughter actually need? And so I don't know if you guys have seen this, but the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine both agree that really uh, from six to twelve, they should be sleeping nine to twelve hours a night. So, and then thirteen to eighteen, really eight to ten hours, which is really hard to get. But when you think about the intensity of their workouts. They really should be at the higher end of that scale, uh, and that is not easy to do. So the recommendation is to try to get as close to the maximum. So uh, it's, just, but it's easier said than done. Yeah. So. A couple of import, important points about that: uh, it really should be appropriately timed, I mean, so that you know you you, um, you know people will say, well, she got like 18 hours of sleep on Sunday. <laughs> and then 12 hours of sleep on Saturday, so that's that's about half. And then the rest of the week, you're doing you know four hours or five hours or six hours. And that's hard to do consistently. And your body, the bodies don't do well with that. And if we can monitor that with the, with the monitoring sheet, we can get a, a general sense of what's happening with them when they're uh, when they're sleeping not as well. So uh, so it's got to be appropriately timed and sleepovers. I, mean, I know we, when our kids had sleepovers, it was a nightmare. They'd come back and they were just completely gassed for two or three days, and it was just really tough. For them. And they were, you know, they weren't practicing 20 to 35 hours a week. So try to minimize the sleepovers if you can, especially if they're in the middle of exams or have meets coming up. You know, those are times you really want to try to minimize that. Uh, sleep position alignment is another important factor. You know, um, we talked about that because we, I remember one of our daughters would just sleep in some cockeyed position and you know she'd wake up the next morning her neck is hurting her back is hurting you know and uh, so for her sleeping was uh, wasn't all that uh, wasn't such a good recovery for her because she was in a bad position so and, and, and uh, gymnasts that sleep on their stomach it just puts their back into an extended position and that's so that's pretty tough so i think it's a good idea to check them at night and just see where they are and see how they're sleeping so i mean it's easy to say you know you should stop using the computer like 30 minutes to them going to sleep, that's not always realistic. That would be great, and sometimes that works, but not always. So these blue light glasses apparently cut that down and help improve the melatonin, so that might help us get better quality sleep. So just a good suggestion there. Uh, there was an interesting study that was done uh, that looked at the, at the young gymnast understanding of sport-related pain and how that contributes to prevention of injury. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there. And then what they concluded is that young athletes who understand that difference uh, between soreness from exertion, so they're just sore because they worked and had a real hard workout, and acute pain owing, uh, owing to injury, are able to make better decisions about how to take care of themselves. So that's important. So it's important for you guys, and I think for us as providers, to be able to help them differentiate that. You know, as a young athlete, maybe they haven't had uh, an injury before. So, um, so they, may, they might need some additional help in figuring that out. And it does make a difference. So it's a worthwhile thing, I think, to, to spend that time talking about that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about urinary incontinence. We're not going to talk much about that, but it is in, there's a, there's a, a 
cheap in your packet. Ned talks a little bit about that. There was a study that showed that 56% uh, of female gymnasts deal with incontinence. That's a big number, and it's not normal. You know, it's a high impact sport. There's a lot of pounding, and, and uh, there was one study that looked at, at in a typical practice, there's 116 uh, impacts uh, for a gymnast in a typical gymnastics practice. That's a lot. So all those high impacts can affect the pelvic floor, it can affect uh, urinary incontinence, and so the handout has a link in there that you guys, if you get a chance, uh, maybe look at that podcast, because it's about 30 minutes, and it's, uh, there's a women's healthcare specialist that talks in more detail about that. So I think that's a good thing, so that's in the, that's in the packet there as well. And then if you have any questions or concerns, one of our PTs, Linda, is a women's health specialist, and she's helped some gymnasts with that. Also, just the urinary incontinence may not be happening now, but it does. But what you want to do is try to prevent it because just because it's not happening now, it could happen in a year, five years, ten. You know, like it's yeah, a yeah, that's true. and it's a cumulative thing. And it's not going to address. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so let's. Uh, we, we started off on these five steps, and so now we want to talk about nutrition and hydration. So, Casey.
sometimes taking certain vitamins can interfere with this. Um, but if you're sticking to a combination of you know, drinking half of your weight in water, it's good. And then having, and then also tracking your urination throughout the day, which can be um, a little bit cumbersome sometimes. So, you know, throughout the day, just making sure that you are hydrating is really important. And the most important thing uh, about realizing if you feel you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. And by that time, it's, it's too late, okay? So just making sure that you're drinking throughout the day, and um, I'll go over more details with that. All right, so you know, general rules of thumb for um, you know, drinking at practice. There's a lot of numbers, and you'll see different numbers of, you know, you need to take 16 ounces, 20 ounces before, after, during. Um, Break it down into you know a couple hours before practice. Try and drink a bottle of water. So you're remember you're drinking half of your weight in water, and this is added, right? And then also a recommendation of drinking another eight to sixteen ounces right before practice. You know sometimes working with athletes, I you know you, you have to gauge um, what they are drinking before before practice. So I don't know if you ever noticed. Um, to practice if they drink too much they end up not performing as well because then they have water that's stuck in their stomach and it ends up creating kind of the sloshy you know as an athlete you know you might have experienced this um, so you know, these are recommendations but a lot of times it needs to be more specific of what you should be drinking throughout the day because if you're going into practice and you have water that's so as you're exercising there's a shunt of blood that goes from your stomach to your muscles so the digestion doesn't happen as much. Um, so, you know, if you're drinking a bottle of water a couple hours before, which is good, but then you're drinking another eight to 16 right before practice and it kind of bogs you down, I'd say don't drink the eight to 16 ounces before practice, okay? So you kind of have to gauge on how you're feeling as well. And then also using some of those other tips to see if you're hydrated, the color of your urine. Um, all right, okay. So then during practice, I know sometimes it's tough to drink water during practice um, because of you know, the availability and then taking, you know, some gyms don't necessarily allow water bottles kind of laying around, um, but the recommendation is, you know, every 15, 20 minutes drinking at least four to six ounces of fluid during exercise. So, um, you know, if you, this is about a water bottle through practice, okay, so it's just kind of breaking it down. Um, if you can't have a water bottle with you at practice, if you have a water fountain available, when you take, depending on the size of the individual's mouth, it's either going to be about half an ounce to an ounce of water when you take water from the um, water fountain. Okay, so you can kind of gauge it that way. Um, but you know, try and have at least a total of a bottle of water throughout practice, and then after practice, within two hours, you should drink another bottle of water. So breaking it down, don't worry so much about you know 24 ounces this try and drink a bottle of water a couple hours before practice during practice have a bottle of water and then after practice have a bottle of water okay but remember kind of gauging based on the color of your urine as well okay because it seems like a lot of water but hydration is so important you know and if you start losing water weights like i said one to two pounds it's just going to increase your injury of uh, um, your risk of injury hydration tips, you know, working with different athletes, um, you know, it's like, how can I get water? You know, they're going to school during the day, or, um, you know, it's, it's one question I ask a lot of times, like, you don't ask individuals, are you drinking water? I ask, are you carrying a water bottle? Because if you're carrying a water bottle, most likely you're drinking water. Um, so it's important to carry a water bottle with measurements on it, so you have a gauge of how much you're drinking, and you're not just kind of guessing. Um, So here are some, you know, this could be kind of a fun activity for your, your child, but um, putting on whether it's a, a milk jug, like a water jug, or there's different companies that actually, you know, have the measurements on the water bottle. You know, this one here is from Camelback. Uh, I'm not sure what this one is, but you can find these, you know, kind of REI um, for Target. They're available anywhere. But measure, measurements on your water, water bottle can be, um, motivational for, for you know a young athlete and it could be fun 
two, you know, carrying around, it could be cool, carrying around a big, you know, wardrobe. Um, but it, it keeps the individual on track, you know. So staying hydrated, you know, kind of like motivational, and you can, you know, this on, on this one, you know, water is good for you. But, you know, starting at the top, you know, by 6 a.m., you know, you should be having this much water. By 7 a.m., you know, and, you know, say it's 3 o'clock, but you have this much water, know you're not getting what you're supposed to. So putting these measurements on a water bottle can be very helpful. Um, you know, you can mark it with the time. You can also mark this one to mark with, you know, ounces. And this one isn't marked with time or ounces. It's just, uh, actually, sorry, it's marked with time, but it has, like I said, this motivational, you know, kind of markings where it says, whoop, whoop. But it's a great idea, and it helps keep you, you know, motivated on track with what you should be drinking. Um, you know, if your child can't keep this, you know, at school, they could take these smaller water bottles and then mark the individual kind of timing on that water bottle. I wouldn't recommend using it, you know, multiple times. I would use it maybe once or twice and then kind of throw it away just because cleaning and bacteria and um, just the product of plastic. Okay. All right. So hydration tips continued.
types of carbohydrates would be your grains, your whole wheat breads, you know, some cereals, fruits and vegetables, couscous, quinoa, whole wheat pasta. The bad ones would be your candy, soda, you know, sugars, chips, cakes, um, different sugary cereals. But ideally, you know, the athlete, and we'll go over kind of a little um, what example is, but they should be getting 60%, 50 to 60% of their calorie intake carbohydrates, okay, and that coming from these good carbohydrates, okay. So carbohydrates are also fruits and vegetables, all right, so when we create a plate, um, you know, the biggest take-home point for fruits and vegetables is making sure that your athlete is getting five servings a day, okay, so five fruits and vegetables, whether it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, for breakfast, they're getting blueberries, for lunch, they're getting having a salad for dinner, it's broccoli, so it's three, and they need two more. Maybe a snack of banana, um, or, you know, kind of a, another snack of, of an orange, okay? But five a day, shoot for five a day, and that way you'll be getting your vitamins and minerals as well, okay? So protein, um, you know, the RDA is 34 grams of protein a day, so basically that's three servings, so it would be breakfast, lunch, and dinner of the athlete having a source of protein. Breakfast for an egg, lunch being chicken, dinner being, um, you know, it's a, it's a salmon, okay? All right. All right, so again, breaking that down, don't worry so much about the numbers because an ounce of meat is seven grams of protein. And this can be more specific depending on the age of your, your athlete, the activity level of your athlete, the weight of your athlete. But ideally, they should be getting three servings a day, which is breakfast, lunch, and dinner of a source of meat, okay? Of protein, it can also be beans as well, okay? All right. These are just some other sources that would be helpful, okay? Nuts and seeds um, have a small amount of uh, protein in it as well, but you can also add that to um, uh, your first nutrition sheets that we'll talk about. All right. So fat is a smaller group but um, I wanted to add that avoiding the bad fats, the fried foods, trans fats, and processed foods, chips, and including more of the good fats in their diet, and that would be the extra virgin um, olive oil, butter, canola oil, and then oil and nuts, okay? Because without these fats, so a lot of times you will avoid fat, but without fat, you can't absorb fat-soluble vitamins, which are KA, D, and E. And then don't forget about the omegas, um, the omega-3s, 6 and 9, which is Especially omega-3 is helpful for decreasing inflammation, which will help prevent injury. Okay. Very good. All right, so creative meal we talked about a little bit. So, you know, your athlete, when they have a plate in front of them, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, they should always in, uh, include a protein, carbohydrate, fruit, and vegetable. All right, so this is a, a plate. A sample meal would include salmon, spinach, and this is couscous, okay? And if they're getting this, you know, most part be getting what they need as far as vitamins and minerals and also these macronutrients. All right, so talk a little bit about vitamin, vitamins. <clears throat> All vitamins are important. To single out one vitamin and saying that, you know, this is the best vitamin, this is what you need, um, you know, I, I, can't, I, I can't do that. But if you're getting, like I said, your five fruits and vegetables a day, all right, you'll be getting your daily dose of vitamins and minerals. However, gymnasts might need more vitamin C and vitamin D. Okay, so sometimes I recommend different supplements, but you know they might need to get more kind of these orange, grapefruit, strawberry, kiwi in their diet to help uh, with prevention. Um, and then also vitamin D, you know, say they have a stress reaction, a stress fracture, but vitamin D comes from the sunlight, um, oily fish, eggs, and some fortified foods, or you can supplement, you know, depending on, on the injury, anywhere from, you know, 5,000 international units to 50. All right, minerals, the most important, um, there's a lot more minerals than these four here, but calcium, iron, magnesium, and zinc. Um, and, you know, if you're a gymnast, you might need more calcium, zinc, and magnesium. So intake of calcium, you know, you, you might need more four servings a day, you know, coming from dairy products, beans, or broccoli, or supplementation. The supplement that I like the best is New Chapter. It's, um, it's actually these different vitamins and minerals that are um, 
extract it from food itself versus instead uh, synthetic uh, chemicals. Um, but you know, they also might need more zinc, which is an antioxidant. Antioxidants help decrease uh, free radicals um, and decrease the oxidative stress. So basically, it's helpful for in injury prevention. You have a, sp a sprained ankle, you know, you might need to increase a little bit more of your zinc. Magnesium is good for muscle soreness. Okay, so. Um, dairies, nuts, Epsom salt baths, or supplementation, okay? All right, so talking about snacks, you know, an athlete who has a busy day uh, but needs a snack kind of before school, after school, one snack that I think is the best would be these Kodiak um, cakes. They can have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It has a higher amount of protein, um, and, you know, kids seem to like it, but you can also put um, berries in it as well. This is X'd out, so no chips, no candies. Bars are a good option too, when you know the athlete is kind of going from practice to school, um, and then just always having fruits and vegetables available with peanut butter and yogurt, okay? All right, so when do we eat? Um, you know, don't skip breakfast. Before practice should you know, be your biggest meal, which is typically lunch, so two to three hours should be your biggest meal. Before practice, one hour before, you should have a snack about 100 to 150 calories. Um, so here's some example, two oranges, an energy bar, or a four cup of trail mix. After practice, you know, 30 to 45 minutes after, you should have a liquid shake, ideally chocolate or strawberry milk. I like Orgain, I think they have a good ratio, you know, when you're thinking of what you should take after practice, typically a two to one, three to one carbohydrate to protein. So I like these guys, but their whole line is different, so you just have to look at the back of the label and you guys have specific about that, we can go over it. And then, you know, saying after practice, you know, having dinner one to two hours after, okay? But this is important, getting that liquid shake and um, having your post-nutrition meal being liquid form is important because it gets absorbed quicker and it gets shunted to the muscles faster. All right, eating on the go, um, you know, it's just with a busy life schedule, these are some of the better restaurants versus here the quality of, you know, have a Panera Bread, Chipotle, and Starbucks is just a better quality. Um, so I would recommend these versus these, okay? But if you have to go here, because sometimes you do, try and make better options, you know, taking the salad or, um, you know, over like a Big Mac or something like that. Okay. All right. So there's a lot to go over in nutrition, and it was kind of quick. So if anybody has any questions afterwards, please come and see me. All right, but we want to get into the movement part of gymnastics. So I'll have Zach talk about that. Very good. There you go. Thank you, guys. Again, I'm Zach. I was a former level 10 gymnast and a collegiate gymnast at Temple. And currently, I coach uh, levels 6 and 7 at Hills uh, now. Okay. Uh, so what I want to discuss today is some screening ideas uh, that I'm trying to implement with my gymnast, trying to teach some parents how to implement on their own gymnasts, which I want to kind of share a pattern today. And the biggest thing I want to look at today is a back handspring or bridging pattern. Um, we're going to look, you know, break that down here in this. Uh, so this here is Lauren, my wife. She was happy enough to uh, model for me during her bridge. Uh, but as you can see in a, uh, a back handspring, uh, we need movement from the uh, hip here opening up, the lower back, uh, the upper back or thoracic rib cage, uh, the shoulder here, and then uh, the wrist extension here. And then the most important thing I look at um, with the gymnast is how well each of those joints are moving. Um, if there are any uh, limitations at um, the shoulder, the rib cage, or hip, usually for the back handsprings, uh, front handsprings, front walkovers, another joint has to make up for that lack of movement, and it's typically the lower back with gymnasts. Uh, they're very hyper flexible in their joints typically, uh, and with the back there's not much muscular around there. Uh, so what I find is, and even Lauren has it a little bit, where it's kind of flexed here, relatively straight here, and then there's that hinge in the back there, and then still even the hips aren't fully open there. Where when gymnasts are doing hundreds of reps of these skills a week during practice, um, that back is bound to get a little bit more stressed if that movement quality isn't up to par where it should be. And what I want to do next is kind of go over different tests you can do with your gymnast. 
Uh, and then if you find any limitations on that, some exercises you can implement uh, for your gyms to try out um, on their own at home. Uh, so this first uh, test here is to kind of isolate the shoulder joint. Uh, and then what you can do here is not allow any movement from the upper back or lower back. See how well the shoulder is truly moving without any compensation uh, from other body parts. And you can see here in the test, and I think you have packets uh, that show all the test uh, kind of details. And what you want to look at here is how well they can keep their back flat on the wall while moving that dowel overhead without any limitations from the stomach there. Um, and then what we can see is what Lauren, she does pretty well, but she has a little bit of a limitation in the shoulders. So when she's going to be doing handstands or back handsprings, there are going to be movements from other joints that have to make up for that lack of uh, movement there. Um, and then why with the gymnast, I see this a lot, is the muscles here, the, the lats and the teres major are strong pull down muscles and gymnasts are doing tons of pull ups, rope climbs, kipping movements, pulling down, L leg lifts, um, hollowing where they're getting really, really strong here. And with that strength, unfortunately adds a little bit of tightness and tightness in these muscles do restrict um, those movements overhead, which they also need as well. Um, and if they're not having that overhead movement, um, they're gonna have a hard time blocking through a straight line um, and other handstands and bridges are not gonna be up to where they need to be. Uh, and then in your packet has the exercises here, uh, but what I try to do with exercises, if they have this limitation, these are my two go-to exercises, where it's a uh, lat stretch here, uh, where uh, the instructions are in your packet, and then also foam rolling the lat musculature, and then what's most important after doing these exercises is to retest what you originally tested. So if your gymnast was, I had, was with someone today, uh, they were about a foot and a half from the wall with their movement, we did these movements in one other exercise and they got to be about four inches from the wall just by doing those tests. And if it's successful for your gymnast, then that's how you know it's the right test or exercises to do. If there wasn't success for it, then there's no time, no point really adding this to your already routine where you already have a, a busy leg kind of going on there, okay? Uh, the next one we see is uh, the rib cage and the thoracic spine. And, and what I find with gymnasts as well is, again, because they're doing a lot of uh, pushing movements, a lot of pull downs, they tend to overall over time get a, a rounded chest up top here and they're, and they're really strong, uh, but that also limits their ability to, to bend backwards um, with that movement. And the test here, what you can do, um, and it's again instructed uh, here on the sheet, but you have the gymnast sit back onto their heels and what sitting back down onto their heels does is locks their lower back into place where it's not gonna allow any movement from there. Again, gyms will always try to compensate with their lower back to start rotating. So this position allows no movement from the lower back. And then what we can see here is how much extension and rotation happens from the upper spine to see that. And typically we're looking for about 50 degrees of motion is what's expected of them. And if somebody does not have that movement, uh, then again, they're not opening through their chest. It's gonna happen from somewhere else. And again, typically the lower back um, is where we're gonna be finding those limitations there. And then limited, thoracic spine, limitation is going to have the same trouble with overhead motion where they're not going to be able to hit their handstands, uh, they're not being able to block well, um, and get, uh, well, block, lose power, but also uh, big deductions for them, probably more important to them. And then here are a couple exercises that I um, listed to try out um, with these. So the first one is a uh, kind of thoracic extension over a foam roller where you're kind of keeping your um, belly down nice and hollow and then using the foam roller as a fulcrum and then extending backwards over it, uh, where you're adding a little bit of movement in the spine, and then here, locking up the lumbar spine by bringing your hip up towards here, and then rotating backwards, again, only allowing movement from your upper half of your spine to do that. And the same thing here, after you do these exercises, uh, retest that previous motion uh, to see if it's made a change for your gymnast or not. Okay? This next one here we'll look at, and that kind of the whole bridging pattern is the, the hips opening up, uh, in this one here, what you want to do is lie flat onto a table. Uh, in the gym you, or at home, you can do it on a bed, uh, but you want to make sure that what you do is you sit back enough and then you hug the one knee 
And that again will not allow any movement from the lower back. Uh, and then you can see it's straight through here and then let the one leg kind of drop down and you'll see what the hip is truly doing. Uh, what I see a ton with my gymnasts and many gymnasts is when they're opening their hips, it's not actually their hips that are opening, it's just their back that is arching. Um, and what that's not gonna allow them to do is A, fully extend when they're trying to set for some gymnastic skills, their back leg and their switch leaves is not gonna be high enough. Um, and then also what their hips aren't doing, their lower back's doing, um, and you see these back handspring skills are just gonna take a little bit too much excess motion in the lower back. Uh, so we wanna make sure that the hips itself is flexible enough, and if it's not, then going on to exercises to kind of address that limitation there. And that's, uh, here you can see, doing some anterior uh, thigh foam rolling to the, the, the quads, uh, TFL and the iliacus here in the front, and then also doing a uh, different type of hip flexor stretch that I have my gymnasts do, and we're actually implementing a good amount more in the gym, uh, where they're pushing their hips forward without their back moving, rather than a big stretch pushing down where it's just their lower back doing the movement and their hip actually isn't opening at all. Uh, so this is something we use, um, well, for my gymnast and then uh, testing some of the gymnasts I've worked with. Um, and actually, and they can feel a nice little stretch in the front. It looks like you're not doing much. I would uh, try that one out, like on your own, or have your uh, daughter try that out. And then also retest that first test to see if it had any impact on that motion from the hip. Okay. And then the last one, here in that kind of bridging movement that we're talking about is the wrist extension. Uh, so a lot of gymnasts due to the requirements of uh, grip strength, and a lot of them have very strong grip power and need it for bars, uh, develop tight forearms, tight forearms, limit extension backwards here in their movement. Uh, and without that movement there, they're not, again, able to hit handstand lines. Uh, they're gonna start to have a lot of increased stress on the elbows, increased stress on the shoulders, um, and then in the back hands, right, can have again through the, there on the back as well. Uh, and what I do for this test, I have the gymnast kind of on their hands and knees, palms flat, and I'll put my finger behind their hand and have them lean as far forward as they can until their hand starts to come up and kind of track where their shoulder is. And ideally we're looking for about 110 degree movement um, from their uh, wrist angle so to know that their body can get that much further over their wrist uh, without, without it coming up. I mean, without them complaining of uh, wrist pain in the front there. And then the wrist exercise I typically do will be soft tissue to the front of the forearm and then also some mobilizations to the, uh, the wrist there. And again, those instructions are in the little uh, packet there. And again, you want to do the exercise, then retest that uh, previous test um, to try that out for you. And then some closing thoughts uh, for, for this. Um, these are just four basic kind of screening tools that I use. I go in depth a lot more typically, uh, but the biggest thing is assessing and not guessing. Um, a lot of gymnasts are very flexible and wouldn't need excessive mobility work on it. It would only make their problem worse. Uh, some gymnasts are very flexible, but they don't have the strength to hit those ranges where their hips are very flexible, but maybe their glutes or hamstrings aren't strong enough uh, to get them into the movements they need. So really assessing to see what the actual problem is and giving them effective exercises is most important there. Um, and then even if a gymnast does have perfect movement, it's never gonna trump excessive volume or excessive volume changes. Um, it's gonna have a dispersed um, load on the body no matter what, but trying to have perfect movement will at least allow uh, each joint to take some of the forces and not maybe impact one joint, uh, particularly the back, the elbows, all of the shoulders. Uh, and, and like I said before, not every gymnast has a flexibility issue, so doing all these exercises isn't gonna help everyone. It's gonna be what you see in your assessment. Um, and then extension pattern is not the only pattern that gymnasts are doing. Um, they're doing a lot of uh, flexion with their scalders and endos. Um, they're doing a lot of landings, single leg landings, um, and then also different uh, very splits. And every single one of those joints could be broken down to see where they might be limiting and having some um, trouble with their uh, skills. And then also what I see with a lot of gymnasts is some of them may actually have good strength, good flexibility, but their motor patterns are poorly um, developed to where they're, they're back bending, they can move everything well, but they still just hinge at their back because that's what they've been used to for years. Or if they're bending forward or landing instead of moving their hips, it's their back that just moves um, for it. 
Uh, and there's a lot of different things like that where, again, you can just looking at it, just seeing the assessment will tell you if it's truly a joint problem, muscle problem, um, or if it's just something where they just need a couple of cues and then and it just fixes what their, what their issue was. Um, that's something that I want you guys to try that at home with your gymnast and then I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what we got going on um, for you guys to come in and for us to try on your, your gymnast so we can help you guys um, with the process there. Okay, so hopefully you guys have a little better sense of some of the screening things that, that we do here. And uh, so that's a, that's a great way to really see what, how your gymnast is moving and what their deficits are. Because everybody has a different deficit. And you can't depend on the coaches to be able to, uh, to individualize things. You know, when they have a number of kids in their, in their uh, number of athletes in their groups, you know, they can only do some generic types of things. They can't do some specific things that your, your gymnast might need. So uh, we do have, uh, so we're offering a free screen. Uh, so a 15 minute screen where you can go into a little more depth than what Zach just talked about. You know, I would definitely encourage you guys to, to do some of uh, the things that, that he talked about. You've got the sheet, it should give you all the tools to be able to do at least that initial screen. Uh, but some of the time, sometimes you need a little bit more depth. And there's a number of other things we also look at the screening type of thing. So, for you guys that are here, uh, we do offer free screening for 15 minutes. We wouldn't do it tonight, but we would sign up for a different time to do that. So also, Casey's available for nutrition consults, uh, so you guys can do that if that's an in interest, uh, interest for you. And then if you have any incontinence concerns uh, with your child, then uh, Linda would be a uh, potentially available person to offer that as well. But again, that's that's a, one of the sheets in the packet. You guys that came in late, that's, we talked about some of those before, but that's, that's a sheet that that's, uh, that's in your packet, so you guys have that. Great. Okay, so now we want to open up for questions. I know some of you guys might need to, to head out, but we're available for any questions that you might have. So any of the three of us, so anything else? We love working with gymnasts. I mean, they're just so, so much fun to work with. And they're so, you know, I, I just, as a parent, you know, I, I just think, I love it. I love to see uh, the, the gymnasts that you guys have because they're so uh, polite. They, they appreciate everything that we do. And they're just a blast to work with. They re really are. And, uh, and they're shorter than I am, so it's great. I love that. <laughs> so it's, it's, that's why I like to work with them. So, um, so anyway, we're around. So if you guys have any questions, we'd love to talk.